Hi everyone. In this video, we are going to be talking about water resources. So water resources is sort of a um, all encompassing term that means a lot of different things. So not only does it include things such as water pollution and water quality, but it also discusses uh, the importance of water in and of itself and also what we're calling water resource problems. So in essentially we're going to be talking about all the different ways that water um, and especially uh, clean potable uh, drinking water uh, is threatened and it's threatened by a, a variety of different things which we're going to discuss. So first of all, just sort of a quick reminder for everybody um, that one of the reasons why our planet is unique is because we have an abundant supply of liquid water and liquid water for um, as far as our living things go on this planet, um, it's a necessity. Every living thing contains water. Uh, we humans ourselves are about 60% water. All of the functions that are going on inside of your bodies, and it doesn't matter if you are a, a plant or an animal or a fungus or a bacterium or whatever you happen to be, um, all of the, the cellular processes that are going on inside of you right now are essentially chemical reactions happening in this water-based environment. So water is critical for maintaining the chemistry in your cells, which would then also mean that it's critical for life as we know it. In addition to just the living aspect of we need water to survive, we also use it for a huge amount of practical every day to day uses that we've kind of built these modern conveniences on. So in addition to just drinking it for our own purposes, we also use it for things like cushing, uh, excuse me, cooking and washing uh, to water our plants, uh, to travel on um, ship travel in manufacturing, mining processes, uh, even our energy production processes are heavily reliant on water. So it is really um, not just critical to life, it's also critical to our lifestyle. What's important to note though, is even though we're a planet full of water, there's actually not that much water that is available for consumption. Less than 3% of all the water on the earth is available to us. Um, most of it is uh, salty. It's unevenly distributed. Uh, there's lots of different uh, things that we can sort of talk about, about why water is so um, not accessible, if you will. So again, if you look at all the water that's on this planet, okay? So if you were to, to sort of measure in gallons, if you will, um, all of the, the gallons of water on this planet, you would find that the vast majority of the gallons of water happen to be salt water, which is pretty unusable. Yes, you can go through the process of desalinization and take the salt out of the water, but it's extremely expensive and it's very, um, it's a high in energy use need. So very few places can afford to do that. So if we take a look at the amount of fresh water that's available, so here we are, this two and a half percent fresh water, and then we break this fresh water down, you'll notice that most of that fresh water still isn't available to us because it's locked up. It's locked up in glaciers. It's locked up in um, permafrost. So uh, liquid that's in the ground that's always frozen is what's permafrost. Um, then we have liquid water in the ground that we can access, which is called groundwater. Uh, and then we have um, what's the surface and atmospheric water. So surface and atmospheric water sort of makes up this teeny tiny little sliver here of 0.4% of the, the water on Earth. So then we pull that apart and we can see other things. So most of it is found in lakes, but we also have it in the soil, in wetlands, in river and even in the atmosphere. So again, we're, we're talking about an awful lot of water, the blue planet as we are known, but when you really break it down, very little of this is available between, again, um, surface water and groundwater. This is what's available to us, and it's, it's not very much. And we use it, again, for a lot of different things, but what you'll find is the primary use of water that we withdraw, and it doesn't matter whether we're withdrawing it from the ground or from the surface, happens to go to just grow our food. Almost 70% of the water that we use that's available to us is just for growing our food. 21% uh, of that is just for industrial purposes. Again, this is energy production, this is manufacturing, and mining, and all of those types of things. And then here we are, this little domestic use here, 10%. So it's very, very little in the grand scheme of things. 
So as we talked about the other uh, nutrients, when we talked about nutrient cycle in the first modules, right, we talked about carbon, we talked about phosphorus, uh, we talked about nitrogen, uh, and I believe water was in there, but if the water cycle wasn't in there, here's the water cycle. Uh, just as a reminder, we have evaporation uh, occurring, which occurs from, from surface water sources. It evaporates into the atmosphere where it condenses and forms clouds. Eventually, with enough moisture in the air, that um, uh, water will re-enter to the ground through precipitation. Uh, and then from there, it will go to a variety of sources and, and eventually, potentially, cycle back again through the atmosphere. So again, I'm sure most of us are familiar with the water cycle, but that's just a quick reminder. So there's two types of water that we're looking at as far as sources of water for us surface water and groundwater. Um, surface water, again, is anything that is remaining on the surface. So this can be ponds, rivers, lakes, streams, wetlands, all of those wouldn't be sources of surface water. Uh, and then groundwater is water that has percolated down through the soil into sort of deeper underground reservoirs. So it, it's not just a little bit of water that's at the surface that the plants use, for example. Uh, but groundwater is, is found, um, uh, again, it can be found uh, several meters underground to, to several hundred meters underground. It just kind of depends on, on how deep um, your your aquifer is. So an aquifer, once again, is, is what we're calling this underground reservoir of water. So here you go. You can kind of see, again, the difference between the two. So as precipitation is coming, areas that become recharged uh, include things such as these lakes and these rivers and these streams. And then again, you have uh, different types of, once again, aquifers here, right? So we have what would be considered a more shallow a shallow well, and then you have uh, sort of deeper wells, which are typically referred to as artesian wells, um, that are from even deeper in the ground. All right, so the first thing before we get into issues of water pollution, let's quickly talk about resource problems. So when it comes to actually having and getting water, there's three different categories of problems that humans face. Too much water, too little water, and poor quality water. So let's talk about too much water first. Too much water happens um, when we have flooding occurring. And a flooding occurring occurs when we have uh, a river or some body of water that um, has so much water that's running off into it, usually because of large rainstorm events or major hurricanes or some other force where you have a lot of water uh, that's coming down at a very quick rate it overwhelms the, the rivers or these lakes or these systems that are designed to hold water. And so the, the water spills over and it begins to creep up into surrounding areas. What exacerbates this problem, what makes it even worse, is that as humans, we tend to like to build right next to these bodies of water. So we like to build in what are called river plains, so that the areas around a river, um, they tend to make fertile grounds for things like farming, for example, and they make nice places to build our homes. Um, and so we have a, a habit of um, taking the area that naturally would flood in these events and it wouldn't cause problems because there would be lots of plants and things that would help to sort of absorb some of that, that excess water. And instead we've cleared all that out and we've built our settlements on it. Uh, and what happens then is you get an awful lot of water then that's encroaching into human settlements. So it's running down streets and it's coming off our buildings and it sort of makes even these problems that much worse. And so the result of that is widespread flooding. Um, even here in the Chicago area, we had an extremely wet May. And that May, um, all that rain in, in May actually did make some local flooding occur. And again, usually it was fairly minor flooding. You might have roads that are temporarily impassable. Um, you might have homes whose basements become flooded, things like that. Um, but in parts of the country, especially along major rivers like the Mississippi River, you can get events where the Mississippi River is again overflowing and you're actually seeing homes submerged underwater because of all of the rain. Opposite that, of course, would be too little water. So you don't have the precipitation. It's very, very dry. Um, there's different types of dry lands. You have arid and semi-arid lands. 
Arid lands would be like the desert. These are places that have very few plants and not much life in general because of the lack of precipitation. And then you have places called semi-arid lands. And these places receive precipitation, but it's usually far and few between. So you get a little bit more rain, but not a lot. What we know, specifically if you look in the, the sort of southwestern United States, is these especially semi-arid lands have become really popular places for agriculture because you have growing conditions, um, temperature year-round that can support growing plants. And so we have a, a huge hotspot of agriculture, specifically in California, because of the, the sort of um, milder climate that you have there. But the problem is, is you don't get enough water. So you have to have huge amounts of irrigation to support all of this food that we're growing in an area that isn't really supposed to support food production. So it's one of those ways that, again, technology, um, in this case, um, irrigation technology has enabled us to grow food in places that normally wouldn't grow food. And we can grow that food year round, but it comes as the cost of using more and more and more water to do that. So what happens is we start to deplete our aquifers. Our aquifers are those groundwater sources, and they're not something that can bounce back quickly. Um, so you have to have good snow melt. You have to have decent rains. You have to have um, that water recharging, and it takes time. It doesn't just happen overnight. And so if you pull the water out a lot faster than can be replenished, you are at risk of drying that aquifer out completely. We can also overdraw surface waters, of course, too. Um, it's not so much an issue here because we have the, the part of the largest bodies of fresh water in the world, the Great Lakes, and many of the communities in the Chicago area actually get their water from the Great Lakes. So we're not at risk of sort of withdrawing too much water from the Great Lakes, um, especially right now that the lakes are at record high levels. But in many other parts of the country, uh, again, going back to the Southwest and even the Southeastern United States, there have been times where um, surface water reservoirs that have been the drinking water uh, for entire cities have come dangerously close to being depleted because of drought. And, um, and then uh, salinization of irrigated soil, um, I'm not gonna sort of talk about that too much, but essentially uh, what it means is that if depending on how um, irrigation is done, sometimes if it's done poorly, you can get <coughs> excuse me salts that are dissolved in the water. They stay on the surface of the soil and they can be dangerous for, for plants. It's called salinization and you can reduce the productivity of your soil that way. So again, I'm not going to go into too much of that. So this is a map that I wanted to show you. This is actually updated from what you all see in your notes. This is as of 2015. And this is the, the other last resource problem was um, poor, poor quality of water, right? So what we're gonna call unimproved water. Unimproved means water that is not being filtered or is not being in some places um, uh, cleaned through water treatments or anything like that. So you're just getting the water straight from wherever you get it and you hope it's clean enough to drink. The good news is, is the vast majority of people worldwide um, definitely have improved drinking water sources. So again, this is coming from um, uh, pipes. Um, it might not necessarily be in their own household, but it's maybe a public tap that they can access so they can go somewhere to a, a local spot in their village and they can and they can get a source of water that again, we call it improved because it's coming through a well or it's coming through some other natural way to sort of clean that water. It's not everybody, but it's, it's a good majority of people globally. We do notice there are some spots in the world where you see those numbers drastically go down. Um, certainly parts of uh, Central Africa would fall into that category, even parts of Asia in some cases where you see we get that number that goes starts to get into less than 50% of their population has access to these improved drinking water sources. So not too little water, too much water, you know, water that isn't, hasn't been improved, water that is, is sort of coming out of a, a dirty source or something is just as big of a problem um, as some of the other water problems we discussed. So just like any resource, water needs to be managed and management includes working towards sustainable water use. And sustainable water use is just the same as any sustainable resource use. We're just looking to be able to make sure that 
we use only enough much much water as we need to make sure that the hydrologic cycle the water cycle can sort of replenish those areas so we don't pull too much water out of the aquifers we don't uh, pull too much water out of the surface lakes we don't waste water that's the idea wise use right it includes recycling and reusing water if possible it includes again reducing um, those are all things that help so water conservation we can reduce water in lots of different fields but remember Domestic use is only made up 10% of what we're using our water for. So really the biggest users are agriculture and industry. And those are the two places where we can see a lot of improvement in water conservation. Um, so let's talk about pollution for a moment. So when it comes to water pollution, there's, there's lots of um, kind of different ways that we can define it. But it's any type of physical or chemical change in the water that is affecting the health of living things. It could be the living things that actually live in the water, like the fish themselves, or it also could be us as humans because we are actually taking in and drinking that water. So lots of things can count as water pollution. We have um, what we call biological water pollution. This includes things like uh, disease causing agents, um, so uh, sewage, the, the bacteria and the different parasites that would come from sewage that's being dumped into these water bodies. We also have um, physical pollutants. So sediment itself is kind of like soil that's been picked up as water travels and it dumps it into a body of water. So sediment is a type of physical pollutant. And then we also have all types of um, chemical pollutants. So these would include um, different types of, again, chemicals in the water. So it could be phosphates, it could be nitrates, it could be um, PCBs, it could be a, a whole host of different chemicals that are that are being dumped into the water uh, based on, on different types of manufacturing processes or, or what have you not. So all kinds of different things here that we can consider, uh, again, water pollutants. So this table kind of nicely uh, demonstrates where these things are coming from and some of the effects and what's happening. And again, it goes through all of the different uh, substances I just mentioned. Uh, sewage, we're going to talk about just really quickly because those places where you did have unimproved drinking water sources in some parts of the world, uh, a lot of the problem is, is that people are using a single source of water for all their water needs. So they're using it to dump waste in. They're using it to wash their clothes in, they're using it to bathe in, and they're also using it to drink in. And what happens is you have um, disease causing agents actually going back into the water that these people are then actually consuming. Um, I'm going to skip over eutrophication, just we're not going to worry about that right now, just as we're kind of getting here a little bit short on time. So your pollution, all your different types of pollution can come from two different places, either what's referred to as a point source or what's referred to as a non-point source. And it's very sort of easy to distinguish the two. Point source pollution pollutants come from a very specific place, like that pipe right there is the source of pollution, or that sewer, or that ditch, or you can actually say, point to it and say, this is where the pollution is coming from. Non-point sources are a lot different because they typically come from a large area and the form of runoff. So rather than just saying the pollutants are coming from that pipe over there, it's coming from all of the, um, it's coming from the golf course and they just fertilized the golf course and then it rained and the rain picked up any excess fertilizer and it washed it down into whatever the local body of water was. So there was no specific point on the golf course where the fertilizer pollution came from. It was the entire area, right? So again, point source, very easy. Here's a pipe. Here's something bad coming out of it. Non-point source pollution is a little bit more difficult to see. It can come from all kinds of places. So it can come from um, streets and sidewalks and driveways and yards and all kinds of things. So again, everything gets sort of collectively picked up with rainwater and that rainwater sort of runs and pulls those pollutants down into typically a storm drain. And then that storm drain empties into whatever nearby body of water there is. So groundwater pollution, um, I'm going to talk about just a, a little bit as well, since a large majority of people do get their 
water um, from groundwater. Again, here in the Chicago area, most communities get their water from Lake Michigan. But the further you get out from the city, uh, the less likely it is. You're more likely to have groundwater instead. So all kinds of concerns, just like surface waters, you still have concerns of pesticides and fertilizers seeping into groundwater the same way um, that you would have them running into lakes and streams, for example. So this particular graphic sort of shows you how different types of pollutants can again seep into groundwater. That's the idea. So it can pollute both sources, surface and ground. So what do we do? We have wastewater treatment plants um, which help to reduce the amount of um, uh, sewage and wastes and things that are being dumped directly back into our waterways. So what we do is we will um, use different treatment methods to clean different levels of uh, the water. So uh, again, we typically have a system where the water that's coming from our surface water source is first cleaned in a water treatment system um, plant, then it's sent to homes to be used, and then that wastewater is also then treated once again before it returns back to where it started from. So there's sort of a two-step process. And again, this is mostly surface water. Um, most groundwater is not treated before it is used um, because again, the ground filters out a lot of things, but this is sort of more um, for surface water. So I'm not gonna go through um, all of the steps here in um, municipal sewage treatment. You use a lot of screens and to get the, rid of the floating debris, and then you use bacteria to eat away some of the biological matter that's left in the water. And then you can um, clean it with um, other different processes if you want to. So here's sort of a graphic that would show you all the different ways that you could clean that wastewater. And then again, it gets dumped back into um, some sort of waterway, nearby waterway. <clears throat> so, <coughs> excuse me, what do we do to control water pollution? Why do we have these rules? Well, we have these rules um, basically because of another 1970s piece of legislation called the Safe Drinking Water Act. And the Safe Drinking Water Act sets standards for your water. And it says your water can contain no more than this level of all of these different contaminant levels. And it's up to your municipality whether you wherever you live to make sure that your water is complying with that. Now, we know there have been instances both here in the United States and even locally sometimes where water wasn't up to that standard, right? Um, it could be because pipes are corroding. It could be because there was an unknown contaminant that was entering into the system. But we do know that there have been communities that have not been able to drink their water because they don't meet these federal standards. The other one is the Clean Water Act of 1977, and this act sets safe levels for all kinds of different uses on a lake. So some lakes you can just boat on, some lakes you can go fishing in, some lakes are safe for swimming. So the Clean Water Act actually describes how you can use these different bodies of water. Okay, and then last but not least is just sort of preventing water pollution at home. Here's some things that you can do if you want to be a little bit more proactive, especially when it comes to thinking about non-point source pollution and trying to reduce the amount of waste that you are um, sort of putting into, intentionally or not, putting into um, our water systems. So um, very quickly here to end things, Water problems here in the United States look different than they do in developing countries. We know that almost one and a half billion people don't have access to safe drinking water. Um, Three billion people don't have access to a sanitation system. It causes lots of water related illnesses. Five million people die every year because of illnesses related to poor quality drinking water. Um, and again, as I mentioned, Sometimes you have people drinking the same water that they're bathing in, that they're putting their sewage in, sometimes garbage gets in there. So it's a, it's a system where you kind of need both. You need both a sanitary system and you also need a drinking water system to help bring these numbers down. But again, uh, it's, it's difficult, especially in some of these um, developing nations.